So we have four conditions for valid regression. Quantitative variables, both variables are quantitative. Straight enough condition, a straight line approximates the relationship. No outlier condition, there are no outliers. We wanna say yes to all of these. And I say the plot does not thicken. That's how I interpret that last one. So we can say yes to it. I like saying the plot does not thicken because we can say yes, the plot does not thicken. We don't wanna see that. So let's take a look at a regression here. Here's a regression. Let's check to see if both variables are quantitative. It's the amount of times people text on Wednesday and Saturday, so both quantitative. Straight enough, does that straight line go through the center of the data? Yes, it does. No outliers condition. Now, this is one people might be a little iffy on, but I'm gonna say, yes, there are no outliers because it's kind of, you know, none of these, I don't know, you could, if you were to say there's an outlier, I would circle something like this. So I would say this goes away from the bivariate trend. I would circle it and say, there is an outlier. No, we do not pass the condition. Remember, yes is good. We want to pass the condition. So if you're saying yes, you're saying there's not a problem. But there is a problem, I believe, with the residual plot. And here is the proper residual plot for us to look at. And if you'll notice, it's really tight in here. So the plot does not thicken the way I say it. That way we can say, yes, the plot does not thicken. But we have to say no the plot does not thicken because we are saying in actuality it does thicken and that's a bad thing because this means in here it's predicting really tight. These points are all around it. The predictions are all very close and the residuals are small. So we're looking at the residual plot now to see how much we missed by. The residual is actual minus predicted and you can see here some of the biggest residuals are like for this person who we thought could be an outlier. If you notice I go up here and they're highlighted in the plot. Notice how this line goes right here, and that person's below it, and so is this person. They go down here, and all this plot is, is the line flat. That's all this is, is the line flat is the residual plot. You just take that line and make it flat, and it's a residual plot. So it looks like the plot is thickening, so the plot doesn't thicken, no. And so that's a bad thing. When you say no, you're like, there's an issue with this. And once again, it could get thicker or thinner. So we want to see what we call equal spread throughout. We want to see homoscedasticity. Um, big words right there. Don't worry about those. We just say it to you guys, the plot doesn't thicken. We don't want to see it get thicker. So remember that. So that least squares line that you saw going through my data, it is the best possible line. It is if we were to draw squares... As in, if you were to see squares here, and we were to take the areas of the squares going up to this line, it's a little bit it's easier to draw if I could just put in some squares. We draw a square down to the line. It's going to make all those squares the tiniest possible squares ever. And this is more of an advanced thing. But the way you should know it is that it's the best possible line. We're not just drawing any old line. This is the best line. Um, it really gets as close as it can to every point. And it does it, there's a lot of great ways to do this with matrix algebra, but it is the best line that we could draw. So that's why we call it the line of best fit sometimes. It's the best possible line. So given jump output, write out the regression model with actual variable names. Lots of ways this could happen. Let's look at the jump output again. So you can see I have the regression equation right here, 19.03 and 1.107. This is B0 and B1. This is the y-intercept and this is the slope. So B1 is the slope and B0 right here, this is B0 the number, 19.03 is B0, which is the intercept, and 1.107 is the slope. You'll notice down here a little bit further in the jump output, so we're only gonna focus in down here. We have the estimate of the intercept and the estimate of the slope. So I would just have to write in y hat, which is what we're trying to predict right here. We are trying to predict uh, Saturday text amount. And so predicted Saturday text amount, I went too far. Predictive Saturday text amount is equal to 19.03 plus, because this is positive, 1.107 times Wednesday text amount. So this is the estimate of the slope right here for Wednesday text amount. So we can also tell one last thing down here, which we'll get to later, but this model is significant right here because the slope is significant. This is a very sloped line and the slope is statistically significant. So we see the p-value once again, p-value for the slope is what tells us that the model itself is statistically significant right here. 
So that's how we could find them uh, in the output. And we would just have to write it like it is right here. Saturday text amount or predicted Saturday text amount is equal to 19.03 plus 1.107 times Wednesday text amount. So lots to interpret here in the output. The output right here, we have B0, B1, and R squared. So B0 is when X is equal to zero, because I want you to think about that logically. You could literally take right now and delete off this X right here. And you could see without X, with X equal to zero, that is what we would predict when X is equal to zero. So I'm gonna put it back in there. So we can interpret this when X is equal to zero, because that's just going to be timesing this by zero, predicted Saturday text amount would equal to 19.03. So when Wednesday text amount is equal to zero, always important to do it in context of the problem. Context, context, context. Please give me context and give your teacher context. So when Wednesday text amount is equal to zero, we expect Saturday text amount to equal 19.03 on average. So I'm going to put blanks in there now for you to fill in when you do examples here for yourself. When X is equal to zero, we expect Y to equal B naught on average. When X is equal to zero, we expect Y to equal B naught on average. So in context, when Wednesday text amount is equal to zero, we expect Saturday text amount to equal 19.03 on average. So let's do the slope right here. Slope is for each one unit increase in X, we expect y to increase by b1 on average. For each one unit increase in x, we expect y to increase by b1 on average. So for each additional time somebody texts on Wednesday, we expect Saturday text amount to increase by 1.107 on average, or 1.108 rounding up. So it's very important to do in context there. Once again, for each additional time someone texts on Wednesday, we would expect Saturday text amount to increase by 101, 1.108 on average. And that is how we do it in context. Next, we have R squared, which is 0 0.7405. We can turn this into a percentage and we can do the interpretation 74.05% of the variation in Y is explained by the variation in X. So let's just plug in right here. 74.05% of the variation in Saturday text amount is explained by the variation in Wednesday text amount. And since our line has a really good slope and the points are around it, that is excellent. Now going from R squared to R, all we have to do is square root R squared. Now very important, if this line is going down, we would see a negative coefficient here for the slope. And then R squared would still be positive, but R would be negative. Because think about when you square a negative, you get a positive, but when you square root something, you don't get that negative back. That's why people say plus or minus when they square root. Um, but the context of this problem will tell you if R is positive or negative. You'll see the slope is positive, the coefficient is positive. The slope is negative, coefficient is negative. So very, very important there. We just interpreted the y-intercept, but we need to see if that y-intercept interpretation makes logical sense. If we said something like, when height is equal to zero, weight will equal negative 120 pounds, well, one, height can't equal to zero, and weight can't be negative. So that would not be logical. Always look at your interpretation to see if it's logical. Now, there's lots we can do with residuals here. You'll notice points like this point here, where someone said they text 500 times on Wednesday. Wow, that's a lot. 500 times on Wednesday, we can go to our calculator and we can solve for what this line would be at. So this line right here, let's go turn the calculator on. 500 times 1.108, just rounding right there. And there is almost our answer. And now we need 19.03424. And there is where the line would estimate. Now, very important, I usually trace up to see, okay, is that at about, you know, it looks to be about 573. Yeah, that's good. That's where that line traces over to right there. It's hard to kind of keep your hand very straight and trace it. So I usually use a straight edge or something to see, is that where that line would be predicting? Now this point, if I hover over it, I think Jump will be so kind to tell me their Saturday 
text amount was actually, and this is their actual, it was actually 250. So since their Saturday text amount was actually 250, um, we can do actual minus predicted. So let's go ahead and do 250 minus second answer. And actual minus predicted gets us their residual, and the residual for them is negative 323. And since we have them highlighted, we can see them in the residual plot, and we might be even able to check our work right here. And it doesn't show us the number. How unfortunate. But we can also trace it over here and see, yeah, it's somewhere in that realm of negative 323.03. So that is what we're looking at right here. We just did actual minus predicted uh, to find out the residual. So the residual is just the difference between what we observe and what we predicted. And yes, you can see here that's about negative 300, more exact on the calculator over here. So it's a little bit of cleanup here, not much else to say. When we look at this right here, residual plots should look nice and neat. They shouldn't have any sort of crazy variation. They should look just like nothing. They, you should look at it and be like, oh, there's no variation in it. Um, so good residual plots are just random scatters of points. And that's what we want to see. You'll know it's a residual plot because the line is at zero. And it will usually say something like residual over on the other side. So look for that where the line's at zero and it says residual. And that's a residual plot. Um, even with this right here, this relationship does not show cause and effect. Um, cause and effect cannot be uh, shown by just doing a regression. We have to do much other things for other classes and other discussions, but cause and effect is not proven by regression. So any idea of, oh, Wednesday text caused people to text on Saturday. No, we, we can't say that. And we can say there's a relationship. It's statistically significant. Do we think, do we know that one causes the other? We don't know that. We have, we can't say that's proven. We just say there's a strong uh, relationship here and there's a lot of variation in Saturday texts are explained by Wednesday text, 74.05%. And that's got it for this chapter. If you got questions, email me. Good luck. <laughs>